Hello, innovators. I'm Todd Wyant, and welcome to the Bridging the Gap podcast presented by Applied Software. You're invited to join our MEP and construction innovation adventure with a mission to propel this great industry forward. My guest today is Amy Peck. She's the founder and CEO of Endeavor VR and host of Future Construct podcast presented by BIM Designs, Inc. Amy lives and breathes virtual and augmented reality solutions. Welcome to the show, Amy. Thanks so much, Todd. <laughs> I always Excited forget to that that's unpack still on my all things my... AR VR. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I always forget that's still on my LinkedIn profile. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. It was a great line. <laughs> uh, yeah, I did a little LinkedIn stalking, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Amy, how'd you get into the construction industry and in this world to begin with? Well, it it sort of a circuitous journey. I. Um, I, I moved out to San Francisco uh, back in 2013 to, to work with a company called Leap Motion, which was this um, you know tiny peripheral, it looked like a little mini iPhone. And you plug uh -huh. it in via USB to your laptop and using your hands, you were able to control things on your screen. And so their idea was every consumer now would have you know, a keyboard, a mouse and this Leap Motion. Um, and it happened to coincide with the release of the very first Oculus developer kit, the DK1, which was this huge headset. And in yeah. you know, their infinite wisdom, we had a you know group of engineers, and of course, you know they just duct taped Elite Motion to the the front of this DK1, and kind of jerry rigged it so you could see your hands in this virtual environment. And when I saw that, it was, I mean, it was truly life-changing. And I know we, we talked about technology as being life-changing, but I just, I, I kept seeing all the, the possibilities. And I was there kind of, you know, running a little banana republic within the company, only focused on enterprise and everyone else was focused on consumer. But, you know, as I was talking to companies in the healthcare space um, and in AEC, for example, um, you know, all of these use cases were coming out. And so I decided to, to jump off into what I call the abyss of consulting. And I started my, my company back in 2015. <laughs> and the rest is history. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. Well, what's been uh, one of the, the biggest change in the space over the, the last year with such a, a radical uh, technology adoption and people forced to look at new ways of, of getting the project done? Yeah, it's interesting because I think where we were, you know, a year, year and a half ago was, you know, a lot of companies were kind of just kind of, you know, putting their big toe in the water and seeing sort of, oh, well, let's do a little POC here. And we were kind of in POC jail and we couldn't uh -huh. really get out of that. And it was hard to get, you know, innovation funds to, to really start to explore the broad possibilities of, you know, AR and VR, um, you know, especially across AEC. And then when we were kind of stuck and we were home, it, it, it all changed. So certainly collaboration was one of the use cases that started uh, to really pique people's interest. So maybe having design teams be able to work together to do you know, virtual walkthroughs, um, their you know ergonomic passes, uh, and, and even in, in, in some ways, very early versions of, of really visualizing BIM data. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think a lot of those those projects started to get fast tracked where before maybe they were stagnating or they were just kind of going at a very, just a very slow and careful pace. It was like, we don't have time to be careful now. We have to, we have to leverage all technology to keep working. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, what do you see has maybe more practical applications for the, the modern projects, AR or VR? Well, I think they're, they have very different use cases. I think VR, you really need to be in a controlled environment. So you're not going to do VR you know, on a construction site um, just because of the yeah. inherent dangers of, of, of that, that environment. Um, so I think it's, it's great uh, at the very beginning of a project before you've really even decided on um, you know, how to build the space. And, and, there, and then certainly for, for um, you know, for looking at BIM data and kind of understanding structurally where things need to go. Um, and then again, it's sort of the back end. When you finish, you can use it as a sales tool, you can use it as a marketing tool, you can do walkthroughs, you can use it for interior design. Um, but kind of in the middle, I think augmented reality is really much more valuable. And largely because 
you know, your field of view is not, you know, is, is not blocked, right? You're, you're able mm -hmm. to just have very lightweight overlays. Uh, and what we want to get to are the wearables. Right now we're a little bit stuck kind of holding our phones or iPads, you know, out, which is still valuable, but the wearables that, you know, we, we refer to kind of as the magic wayfarers, they're coming um, and Facebook and Apple, you know, have been teasing at this for a couple of years now. And we're hoping to see something towards Q4 this year or Q1 next year. Uh, and I think that's really going to be a big driver of, of adoption because now it's going to be that evolution of when we move from having personal devices to sort of a bring your own device, you know, in, into your workflow. Yeah, so I'd love to lean into the, the wearables a, a little bit more because you know you as, as you mentioned we've been hearing about this for a, a while that it's coming and it's gonna kind of be pretty revolutionary and when it comes and, and do a lot of cool things but i, I think people have a, a sci-fi view of of wearables uh, so i mean, you know you see like csi miami <laughs> or like any of those shows where they're just like moving things around and it's all this crazy stuff and just flinging random things <laughs> uh what is actual wearables and, and like what is it what's it going to look like when it really infuses into the construction project well i'm glad i'm glad you, you said that because we do need to manage expectations when they come out because the the first versions are going to be just really really lightweight overlays like you might be able to see a text you might be able to kind of get directions um, you know, on a construction site, you may just be able to see uh, some kind of data. Again, I, you know, I kind of refer to BIM because I think BIM is sort of the most valuable as you're moving through a project, um, you know, being able to see overlays, you know, or what a built environment might look like when it's done. Um, and then we'll sort of move into in the same way that we have now LIDAR on our phones, we may be able to take, you know, a scan of an environment and then compare it with, um, you know, whatever uh, drawings that we have that we've been working from to make sure that our, you know, our the way we're building this environment is the way it's meant to be, and especially when we tie payments to it. So, so when, you know, we're doing uh, kind of a, a completion assessment and we've done a LIDAR scan and we're able to actually visualize that with the glasses, we're able to see what still needs to be done. And especially if you're on the side where you need to trigger that payment, you're gonna get it done. So I think where it's really just going to enable kind of a slightly faster life cycle in the short term. In the long term, I think it's really going to change the industry tremendously. Yeah, what do you think that that timeline is for? The long term? Well, it's hard to say. And I'm, I'm not one to, to predict the future. I'm actually, you know, I think I think we should all really be thinking about how we want to use technology and, and build towards that end. Um, but it, I would say in the next three to five years, we're going to see not only incredible improvements to the wearables, very much in the same way that the evolution of mobile, we can we can draw a line to how mobile evolved from just a, you know, a cell phone to when, when you know, the, the very beginnings of, of texting, when you think about it now, how incredibly awkward texting was when you still had to like press all the numbers, like, you know, if it was a B, you had to press like the two twice. There's people out here listening going, they don't even you got know really good at that about. though, of knowing how many clicks. I'm, isn't it crazy? It's just like, yeah, but, but um, you know, then to moving to, to real smartphones and then how they became part of our day-to-day -day workflow, you're going to see that same evolution with wearables, but it's going to be much more condensed because now we, we've already identified how we would use AR in, in a lot of the business contexts, uh, just using mm -hmm. mobile AR. So that will translate to these wearables. And even though I say magic wayfarers, it's funny that Facebook actually has a deal with Luxottica who happened to own uh, Ray-Ban who make Wayfarers, so they may actually look like Magic Wayfarers when they when they hit the market. Nice, that'd be pretty cool. Hey, it's stylish. <laughs> well, <laughs> like that's, it. what it, that's, that's what it's going to have to be, right? Because the the two you know real wearables that you have now that are on the high end computing side are the Hololens uh, Two and Magic Leap, and both of those are I even have a, a Magic Leap sitting here. So I wouldn't refer to them as wearable, but they're remarkable devices right so no one's going to walk around with this yeah <laughs> yeah and so that's why the functionality 
when we get started is really just going to be uh, focused on what you're looking at. It's going to be a very lightweight overlay. It may be data, it may be text, it may be directions, you know, in the space to show you how things might look. Um, mm -hmm. But it's going to evolve pretty quickly. But it's also how we end up using them as consumers. You know, will will dictate how it evolves and and you know, just with our movements and the way that we interact with this digital layer is going to inform the next generations of the, the software development kits for these devices. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, how do you go about encouraging people on site for adoption of these new wearables and, and something else to kind of interact with tech wise? Yeah, it's it, we've got to look at technology as you know, instead of being, you know, a solution looking for a problem, just think about, you know, find someone who's got them. If you don't want to invest in them, find someone who's got a pair and, and just take a look because the minute you go in and you see what it looks like um, using, whether it's a wearable or whether it's in virtual reality, you start to have ideas then how you would use it for your own work. And that really, really will inform, again, how you think about the solutions. And there are a lot of people already trying to solve some of these problems. But I think where we miss with technology is that we just kind of wait for someone to build something useful for us. And we don't really think we have a voice. But we do have a voice. Mm -hmm. And I think the more that we talk about, as, you know, with shows like this, what are the tools that we need? What does the technology do? What are the tools that we need? And then look at the technology as more of kind of a recipe book. And this can be with all technology. It can be with wearables, it can be with AI, it can be with blockchain. If you're trying to solve a problem, talk about the problem. And believe me, there are people out there and founders and entrepreneurs out there who want to solve these problems and will help, but it really, it needs to be kind of a two-way dialogue. Yeah. Well, and mentioning AI, I think as, and then circling back to what you were saying with people have that their voice and how they're going to use it is going to dictate future iterations of it. But with AI tying into these products, how they're interacting with it, what they're using for it, how they're looking for it, how they're pushing the system beyond where the developers even kind of designed it for is going to be crucial too. And if you want to see the change coming in, you're going to have to get involved, use it, really interact with it, kind of push it to its breaking points and develop new ways to, to do it. And the AI will, in theory, start picking up on that and it will, you'll see it in future iterations. I love that you said that, Todd, because I think that is really critical that we all need to get involved with technology in general and just have a, a working knowledge of what the technology is it's funny, you know, because you mentioned, you know, CSI and I use like Minority Report and Iron Man. Like it's not a coincidence yeah. that augmented reality looks like that, right? And that's the direction we're going. It's kind of because we haven't really taken the time to think about, well, what do we really want from the technology? What do we want this tech? What do we want our futures to look like? So we just see that and we go, well, that seems like it's logical. Let's just do that. Um, but I think we all need yeah. to be part of this dialogue because the technology is coming so fast. It's, it's unbelievable. And, and all of the technology is moving at an incredible pace. Like it's hard for me to even keep up with the advancements just in AR and VR, let alone blockchain and AI. And so the, the, the better we're educated, the, the more we'll be able to leverage technology as our friend in the future. Right. Yeah, I think that brings up an interesting question then because the technology is coming so fast there's new stuff coming up all the time even the old stuff is being updated to new features and everything how is anybody expected to maintain just neutral on on all the incoming uh, and not just get totally overwhelmed and be like oh whatever i'm just going to stick with these two things that i know and that's it you know, I think that there's a lot, there are a lot of good resources out there. I mean, I, you know, set up Google alerts. So I see different articles. I mean, subscribe to a couple of blogs, subscribe to a couple of newsletters, listen to, you know, podcasts like this one uh, so that you be, can become informed and it's okay to, to focus your attention on the things that matter to you. So if you're in the construction industry, pay attention to the technology that's coming out in construction. I mean, I'm amazed every day, the things that I, that I, 
just read about on, you know, from robotics to, you know, how they're leveraging AI to, you know, to prefab to, you know, AR and VR. And so it's a little bit of information goes a long way. Um, I always point to, I always like to take a shot at nextdoor.com. I feel bad because um, I, I think the people who built Nextdoor as an application have the best intentions and it's just become a way for people to like vent and whine about things. So take the <laughs> 10 minutes where you write like seven pages of you know how indignant you are that someone cut in front of you at the Whataburger line, and read an article <laughs> on technology. Like you know, it's a good use of time. <laughs> that will make you feel better. Yeah. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> but I've stopped looking at my next door alerts because it's <laughs> it's like it's a rabbit a hole. I mean, it's somebody yeah. some one one of the um, guests on our show actually referred to it as getoffmylawn.com and I almost fell off my chair. Yeah. That was very funny. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a bad HOA meeting that never ends. <laughs> I, it really is, it's, it's so true. But we love you, the people who built next door. You did a really nice job. I think you had the best in That's, right. <laughs> That's, <right. laughs> That's awesome. Uh, well, going back to a line that you said earlier, you, you mentioned how we wanna use the technology should uh, dictate how we built or, how we want to use the technology and then build towards that end, something to that effect. Uh, I'll, I'll get the exact quote later. <laughs> uh, how, when we're thinking AR, VR, what is kind of your vision of the future and how would we build to that end? Oh, that, I, I love that because I, I, I often ask a similar question. Uh, you know, I think, you know, what I see is data all around us and kind of in, in context based on location so that using a wearable, uh, you know, when, when we walk into a space within the next 10 years, there will be hundreds of thousands of overlays and, and pieces of data. And that can be anything from structural, you know, building data to, um, you know, to graf digital graffiti to even a social media, like an experience, I call them experience pod, where we might record ourselves in a location with friends, much in the same way we share things out on Instagram and Facebook, but it'll be a 3D little moment in time that will just kind of hang in a space for our friends to see. And if you walk by it and you happen to be connected to me, you'll see, oh, you know, Amy and so-and-so and so-and-so were here. And do you want to see that experience? And it will be able to really access any kind of data anytime with, with what we call the AR cloud. And which is essentially, you know, we probably heard digital twins, you know, of, in, in building and construction. Mm -hmm. This is a digital twin of the entire planet. And it's going to be this, these layers and layers and layers of data that are accessible all the time and will power smart cities. And so I, I love this idea of just kind of creating these um, living, breathing experiences and, and, and they're, they're all over the world and they can be anywhere and you can experience anything at any time uh, and you can be with anyone at any time, anywhere. And so I think, you know, this notion of, oh, you're in augmented reality, you're in virtual reality, you're in real life, in real, you know, IRL. Um, those lines will get blurred and it won't really matter. We won't really be thinking about what reality when it's just going to be a seamless experience. Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, one of the things that I've been talking a lot about of late is how do we leverage the data that is, is being just inundating construction right now? You know, there's, there's so many data points, but not all of them are connected very well. Uh, in order to really springboard it and leverage it in for any real practical way. And those that, that can and are able to start connecting those things, it's, a lot of times they're, they're not taking the time at the, the front and planning out how they're going to use the data and what they really want to get out of data. They're just like, feed the, feed the data monster and, and collect everything that you can. <laughs> how with all the AR and VR data coming in then, can you... Or what should people be thinking about when they're they're taking the time on the front side to plan out this is what I want to use from the data that's coming in and this is how it's going to impact me later on. Yeah, that's a it's you know that's a real conundrum right now because 
we still don't quite understand. I think you absolutely hit the nail on the head. There's just so much data and we don't really know what data points are the most important for how we move forward. Um, so, so my advice is, is to, is to collect as much data as you can. And, and if, you know, it, it does get expensive, but if it, if it's, if it's affordable to be able to just maintain that, you know, you consider it a data lake, um, there will be data points that we will start to discover as, as AI gets better, as machine learning gets better and machine learning right now. Um, is an easier path than true AI because with machine learning, you, you know, you have a, just a, a specific you know, set of data and you're just, you're just running different options and different paths. Uh, and then with, with true AI, the next stage would be to start to build um, real kind of simulations so you can model out different ways. And I, I, I like to use like an ergonomic pass because that's, that's one way that I think people can visualize. Like if you think of um, just interior design um, and how space is used and, and the sort of human factor, looking at how a person might move through a space, uh, you know, is really hard for us to visualize, even using VR, right? Because you'd just have to keep mm -hmm. the, do a new one and then you'd walk through that and then you'd you know, get another one. But an AI can model out any number of scenarios at you know, quantum speed in the very near future. Um, so those are some of the ways I think that, that we need to leverage data and making sure that we focus on the human factors because it doesn't matter how beautiful a building is if it doesn't serve the humans who are going to be in that, in that space. And so, um, and, and I've heard a lot of that too when, when we do, uh, I do a lot of envisioning sessions with big companies to really get them out of the lane that they're in because they're like you like you said you know they're just they're kind of focused on the one thing and the task at hand and they've got multiple projects and they need to get them done and this is just taking a moment and and really kind of projecting into the future not only on a personal level um, but really thinking about what what are what does your business look like in 20 25 30 50 years and and what does construction mm -hmm. look like in that time and what's, what's amazing is that when, when you take people out of that environment, I usually break into three or four groups, depending on how big a group we have, they always come back with really similar, very, very human wants. And so that, that mm -hmm. is how I believe we should leverage technology is, is, is that sort of that human interaction and what makes us human and what keeps us human and then how we're going to interact in any particular space in the future. Yeah, I love that because uh, you can't take the human element out. I mean, that's why technology is around is to enhance the the human experience, not to take away or you know come in and just dominate everything. It's it's to enhance that human factor. And if you take that out, then you're, you're, you're what, what we're living in Westworld. You know? <laughs> living in Westworld. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I think that that's a. I think keeping the, the human factor in is hopefully pretty comforting to, to people of, of really focusing in on that, that that's, I mean, that's what it's all about. That's what everybody's aim is and what construction I think does better than uh, a lot of people is really focus on that. I mean, that's the, the core, core goal behind construction. You're building something for some real human being. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what, what do you see as some of the, the biggest misconceptions around AR and VR? Well, I think people have a, a little bit of a discomfort, particularly around virtual reality, um, because, you know, you can't see your environment. And just for everyone's edification, um, so, so virtual reality is, is when you're in a headset and you cannot see your surroundings at all. And then augmented reality on the other end of the spectrum is like kind of like Pokemon Go, that's mobile AR, right? Where you have sort of a digital overlay um, or it was in Google Glass in the early days where you know, you'd have a pair of glasses and you could maybe see your text in the corner. And then mixed reality is where we're going to get to where really this, uh, the digital objects are kind of, um, sort of seamlessly integrated into real life. So for example, if you know, if you saw a digital ball on your desk, if it rolled off, it would bounce, it would behave the way something real would. And that's where we're, we're kind of moving to. 
and if you look at that as a spectrum, I think there's just a lot of misconception about you know what that would look like and and how we would interact with with these objects or data, um, and then virtual reality. I really urge people to just try a headset. Um, Facebook has uh, you know Quest Two. Um, uh, HTC is coming out with a very high end headset with with really really high visuals. Um, I would say go and you know just get into a headset and try something fun like Beat Saber or Super Hot or one of the one of the fun games. Um, uh, there's even one um, uh, that has this underwater whale adventure that's that's spectacular. So you don't have to necessarily play a game, but once you go into these environments and you see what the capabilities are. It all it just opens up all new possibilities. And so if, if you have any kind of a fear factor, do it seated, put on a headset, give it a try, walk through, do a virtual walkthrough. Yeah, love it. Uh, so you mentioned that spectrum of between AR and, and VR and everything in between. What makes the most sense for a company to embrace a, on a workflow side of things with AR and VR? Again, it goes back to, you know, what problem are you trying to solve and what are the efficiencies that you can bring? And I think for, you know, AR, it will be kind of much more ubiquitous, right? It's going to, you know, it will get to the point where everything that you do on your mobile device or on your laptop can be projected in your field of view. So we're moving from a 2D screen to really 3D space. And so it's sort of why there's also you'll you'll hear a term called spatial computing, and that's you know when you start to get to this magic leap device and the, the Hololens two device, um, where really the world is your screen, and you can access any data at any time. So it's really just going to be trial and error. You know, once you start to use these in your day to day life, just to communicate with people and very much in the same way we started with our phones, right? We just use them to be able to call people while we were on the road. And then texting became kind of the norm for communication. And then once they became these little computers, we came up with all all kinds of ways that you know, we were able to leverage them. Mine has little dings and bells and whistles all day long just to remind me to do things, right? And that's just how I've leveraged the, you know, that this particular device. The same thing will happen once the wearables are out, you know, and you start to see, oh, actually, wouldn't it be great if I could have this information while I'm walking through this part of the construction process? Or wouldn't it be great if I could actually take the inspector through without him ever having to come on site so that he can at least tell me, yes, actually this looks fine. Or maybe, you know, you need to fix this before I bother coming out because the last thing you want to do is have an inspector come out two and three and seven times, right? You want them to come out one time and sign off. And so it's the same yeah. kind of scenario. It's just, you know, how do we build efficiencies and those efficiencies will come in just the form of, of allowing people to, to do their jobs either from home or without taking an extra trip or, uh, or even just moving forward and having any kind of data on site that they need to access at any particular time, especially when you think about maintenance of a building afterwards, you know, having a true as built as a digital twin and you have, let's say an HVAC repair person comes in and they put on their glasses they only get the permissions to see where all the ducting is right but they can mm -hmm. see through walls but only yeah. an, an, an hvac person would be able to define exactly how that would benefit them and so that's why it's really important to be part of the conversation so that these tools are built for your specific role right yeah Absolutely. What do you think could impede the growth of AR and VR? It's it's challenging to deploy um, because it, you know there are certain secure environments. You may be um, you know building, let's say, a data center, for example, where you know protecting the you know the structure and the schematics of that particular space. If it's, if it's a sort of a critical uptime environment. Um, or is going to be housing, um, you know, critical data or highly secure data. 
So th there are some challenges in just kind of the practical kind of back end deployment on whether it's an on-prem on servers, whether it's um, you know, public cloud, whether it's private cloud, if it requires a separate um, private Wi-Fi, uh, those things are right now expensive to build. Um, but, but like anything, you know, things get smaller, they get less expensive, they get easier to deploy. Uh, and again, it's all kind of you know, converging now and, and we are working very hard on overcoming those particular obstacles. Mm -hmm. Nice. Uh, well, at the, the start you, you threw out AI, we've talked a, a little bit about it, but uh, want to pick your brain a little bit on, on AI and then blockchain as well too, to, I know that's a whole can of worms in and of itself, but <laughs> uh, where do you see the potential of AI and blockchain with AEC? Well, I think with AI, you know, we did talk a little bit about it. It's it's really looking at, um, a pro, you know, optimizing processes. Um, and that can be in the design phase that that can be, again, around, I think human factors is, is one of the areas where um, it can be incredibly valuable. And then blockchain it has so God, there's so many different opportunities with blockchain, but even around smart contracts, we talked about you know triggering payments that you know once um, a particular space uh, you know meets the criteria to trigger a payment and sort of the next um, you know phase of a project uh, and being able to kind of combine the data that you're pulling from devices or from your smart device. Uh, and then kind of, you know, ratify that to the blockchain and compare that against, uh, you know, a visual in a smart contract. So it, it starts to become, you know, again, a building block, sort of a, you know, a recipe of, of just efficiency, really. And, and blockchain has many, many applications, even around sourcing materials, for example, so that, you know, you can ensure that um, you know, the materials being used are environmentally sound, that they were sourced from where they were, they said they were sourced from. Um, and, and then, you know, moving to, and I, and I hope this is the case, both with AI and, and leveraging blockchain for this, really starting to embrace this notion of open source. And I think that's really scary for, for companies who, you know, when they want to maintain their IP, if they have a process, that is making them better than the competition. They want to hang on to it. But the truth is open source over and over again has, has proven to us that really it, it elevates everyone. And if you had a good idea around that piece of IP, you'll have another good idea around another piece of IP in the future. And, and it's all kind of interconnected. And I think we have to work towards some of the bigger, again, more human problems that we've been, I mean, you've seen some of the problems we've been facing and we have many, many more. And, and whether it's the construction industry or just us as individuals, you know, how do we, how do we wanna live our lives? And again, leverage a little bit of, of each of these technologies to that end. And it, and it sort of starts with a personal vision. And what is your personal vision? What's your perfect future? What does it look like? Yeah. Love that. Uh, what aspect of all that we've talked about do you think kind of reaches critical mass first in the industry? You know, I of course, I, of course, I'm going to say I think probably augmented reality. <laughs> that, was, <laughs> that was an easy one. You knew I was going to go there. Um, but but I, but I but I see that that it, there's um, there's such a value to being able to access data and sort of visualize data um, and different kinds of overlays especially in context and in location and in situ. So, you know, when, when you're on a location, being able to access data. Um, but, I, but I think it, it's, again, it's kind of up to us. It's, it's where we see the opportunities. I think automation, um, which is tied to robotics, we say robotics, but it's really automation. Um, and I think even looking at just the process, the, the concept of, of prefab has great efficiencies built in, um, but, then kind of leveraging again AI to look at how we're we're uh, kind of building and then how we're delivering on site and then how we're um, you know constructing it's it's sort of infinite and so I, I don't know that one technology is necessarily going to take up take off over another I think the industry is going to change and become so much more efficient over the next decade uh, that, that we won't even recognize where it is in 10 years from now. 
Mm -hmm. I agree. I, I think it's funny that you, you use the 10 year mark because I often say the next 10 years is going to look radically different than the last 50 years of construction. We're at this really cool kind of dawn of uh, this vibrant technology age in construction, I think, where oh, the last year kind of forced a lot of people's hand in the technologies realm, but there's just so much possibility in construction. And I think it's, it's just going to really take off over the next decade. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. And I think even how we use space. Um, so you, you've seen these kind of these vertical farms, right? And so I think that's kind of a really interesting blend of, you know, agriculture and construction. So maybe you know, instead of architecture, engineering and construction, it's going to be agriculture, engineering and construction. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, construction is at the core of how we live our lives and, and, and yeah. how, and, and now we're even thinking, okay, well, how, do, how do we actually build uh, sustainability and and how do we build you know the farms of build we're thinking about building the farms of the future and I think I just think that kind of blending of uh, what's what you know have always been kind of sort of disparate verticals are now kind of coming together and merging and I'm very curious to see how how that evolves over time yeah definitely uh, so I'd love for you to tell the audience about the future construct podcast and what you guys got going oh, on over there. Yes. Yeah. So um, BIM Designs is uh, is our is our amazing sponsor and producer uh, for Future Construct. And we talk to all kinds of people. So people um, in the construction industry, venture capitalists, technologists, people who are really building this future. And uh, we have a really good time. We have an interesting kind of broad swath of guests. And we, we, we like to also really bring in kind of underrepresented groups to, to kind of talk to us. We have a, a lot of great women who come on uh, to the podcast and, and share their, their history and how they, how they came to be in the AAC industry. Um, but really at its core, it's, it's about technology and our future. And, um, and, and so we have a lot of fun with it. And so I, you know, I hope your listeners will, will maybe give us a listen one day too. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. It's a, you guys are doing awesome things over there. It's, Thank you. It's exciting to listen to it. Uh, so how do people get a hold of you and, and find out more information? Uh, you can go to the BIM Designs website and uh, click on podcast and you'll see all of them, but we're on all the, the usual, usual suspects. We're on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, uh, or just feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm generally pretty responsive as long as you're not trying to sell me, um, you know, hot leads or offshore development, I'll, I'll <laughs> most likely reply. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Those are, are coming more fast and furious. It's, I feel like <laughs> I actually had to put a message on my, um, on my description on LinkedIn to say, just please, please, you know, I can see that that's what you do. <laughs> yeah. Does it work? Yeah. Did it stop? No. Cause they just don't read it. You know, it's all, right. <laughs> that's what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Uh, well, last question for you, Amy, what does innovation mean to you? Innovation to me is uh, actually a very personal journey. And I think it's one that we think of as this sort of lofty goal that, that you know, R&D departments do or innovation hubs do. Um, but I think that we, we can all be innovators. And, you know, I, I like to use the example of, of Steve Jobs and that no one was asking for the iPhone. But he came up with the iPhone because it's something he wanted. He kind of projected, you know, what, what does he want his life to look like in the future? And that's how he came up with so many amazing products. And it's amazing when you just allow yourself to kind of take a step back from your day to day, you know, that you're very admired in and, and really ask yourself if you could just create your perfect future, what would it look like? And if you take the time to do that, you'll find that it actually gives you some clarity in your day to day and it gives you a fresh perspective and, and it's actually kind of a fun exercise. Love that. But yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> Take time for a little brainstorming and ideation on a yeah. white piece of paper. It's exactly. great. Yeah. 
Awesome. Well, Amy, thanks so much for joining the show. I really enjoyed the conversation. Likewise. Thanks so much for having me.